Assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'd like to welcome you all to our third session on the tafsir of Surah Ar-Rum the 30th chapter of the Holy Quran and we left off our discussion on verse number 11 and inshallah we'll pick up from there A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim الله يبدأ الخلق ثم يعيده ثم إليه ترجعون. God originates creation, then brings it back, then unto him you shall be returned. In the previous verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the final destination, the, the final outcome, for though of those who who reject his signs and and make a mockery of his message and these are typically people who who ridicule and who mock the idea of of resurrection they they make fun of the concept of a hereafter of a life after death here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and many of them used to express amazement you know in fact they would be you know they would question even the possibility of such an occurrence. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu yabda'u al-khalq. God originates creation. Thumma yu'idu. Then he brings it back. Then unto him you shall be returned. Now what is, what is meant when Allah says, God originates creation? Some have said that, some of the Mufassireen have said that Al-Khalq, when, when, when Allah says Allahu Yabda'u Al-Khalq, that God originates creation, this refers to a specific creature, specific creation, and that is the creation of man. Because the human being is, is really the, is, is the one who will be resurrected and held, to, held accountable along with jinn. So resurrection really revolves around these beings that are mukallafin. Allahu yabda'u al-khalq, God originates creation. It refers to the, the composition of human beings from dust. That the one who, who created man from dust will bring him back to life after they are reduced to dust. So al-khalq here is not a reference to all of creation, but rather it's it's speaking specifically about al-makhluq, and that is the, the creation of, of man. ثُمَّ يُعِيدُ And then they will be brought back to life. ثُمَّ إِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ And then they will, and then unto him they shall be returned. There is another ayah in the Quran where Allah mentions this, this idea that He is the originator of creation and He shall bring back creation. And if you and and the ayah is from Surah Yunus, Surah 10, ayah number four, Allah says, "Ilayhi marjukum jamia." Unto Him you shall all return. Wa'adallahi haqqa. This is. The promise of God, which is true. <inaudible> he originates creation and then brings it back. <inaudible> the purpose of resurrection is what? Who does he bring back and for what purpose? He brings back human beings. So he can reward and recompense, he can compensate those who believe and those who do good deeds. So you see that typically when the Qur'an speaks about originating creation and bringing it back, it's referring to the creation of man specifically. If you, if you look at the way that Allah speaks about the creation of, of the human being, in our in our physical creation, we go through a, a type of evolution, 
on an, even on an individual level, we go through these phases of development. And death is also another phase of our development. So if you look at Surah Al-Mu'minun, so you know, we're, we're trying to understand you know, what Allah means when He says, Allahu yabda'u al-khalq, that He originates creation. The creation of man began with what? Allah says in ayah number 12 of Surah Al-Mu'minun, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ سُلَالَةٍ مِنْ دُونٍ That Allah created the human being from a draught of clay, from the essence of clay. ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُطْفَةً فِي قَرَارٍ مَكِينٍ Then He made him a drop in a secure dwelling place. You see, the the creation of man was not something that was was instantaneous. It it happens through stages. All of us go through these these creational stages. Then he made him a drop in a secure dwelling place, which is the womb. And this is something that we take for granted, brothers and sisters. You know, today, in the year 2020, there is... Scientists have have been unable to create an artificial womb. You know, they might be able to, to, you know, put a child in an incubator. But no scientist in the world can perfectly mimic and simulate the womb. There is no such thing as an artificial womb that we can put in, uh, that we could, that we can put a fertilized egg in. It doesn't exist. This is the, the handiwork of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secure dwelling place. ثُمَّ خَلَقْنَا النُطْفَةَ عَلَقَةً فَخَلَقْنَا الْعَلَقَةَ مُضْغَةً فَخَلَقْنَا الْمُضْغَةَ عِظَامًا فَكَسَوْنَا الْعِظَامَ لَحْمًا ثُمَّ أَنْشَأْنَا وَخَلْقًا آخَرًا فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ So these are verses 12 to 14 from Surah Al-Mu'minun. Where, where Allah says, continuing where we left off, then of the drop we created a blood clot. From that drop of semen, Allah formed a blood clot. Then of the blood clot, we created a lump of flesh. Then of the lump of flesh, we created bones. You know, it's amazing how, you know, we began as one single cell. But this cell, is able to multiply and divide into specialized cells. We have skin cells, we have bone cells, we have, you know, uh, we have neurons, we have all these different cells that originated from that one single cell. This is an amazing creation. Then of the lump of flesh we created bones and we clothed the bones with flesh. You know, people in the in the past before you know, modern science, they didn't know, you know, what came first. Is it is it the flesh that's created first or is it the bones? Allah says, he, t- he makes that lump of flesh into bones and then he clothes the bones with flesh. Then we brought him into being as another creation. Blessed is God, the best of creators. So, God originated this creation. And this creature that goes through all of these these uh, stages of development, do you presume that with death, the development of man ends? That it's, that's it? This beautiful, magnificent creation, with all of its fine detail, ends in 50, 60 years, and that's it? There's no more progression? Allah says, no. Allahu yabda'u al-khalq thumma yu'idu. Then he brings it back. Because the, the development has to continue. In fact, death is like a type of rebirth into, into alam al-akhira. So when Allah says, Allahu yabda'u al-khalq, God originates creation. Some have said that it refers to the creation of man. Because the verse says, and then we bring them back, and to, and to God they shall return. And it is the human being 
that will return to God for reckoning, for accounting. The other creatures, they're not, they're not accountable in the same way that human beings and jinn are accountable. There's a, a statement, an excerpt from the first sermon of Nahj al where the commander of the faithful, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he speaks about the, the origination of, of Allah's creation. How Allah brought things into being. He says, أَنْشَأَ الْخَلْقَ إِنْشَاءً he originated it with an origination. And he began it with a beginning. You know, when you and I want to create something, you know, we typically have to expend a lot of mental energy. We have to think, we have to plan. We have to reflect. This is this is a rawiyah. But Allah creates without thinking, without reflecting. There, there, there is no mental activity that has to happen before creation comes into being. And not only that, you know, when you and I create, when we invent, we we have we rely on what? We rely on experience. You know, companies that ma manufacture vehicles today, they they build on what? Their past experiences. That's why every year we have new models. There are new modifications that are made. Why are these modifications made? Because engineers benefit from their, their own past experience and the experiences of other engineers. So they have some type of blueprint to work off of. But Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, Allah creates without thinking, without reflecting, and without any experience, without any trial and error, without going off of the example of another creator. Allah creates everything with perfect originality. There was no blueprint for him. And he does it without thinking. There's no planning, there's no... You know, measuring that has to happen, it's, it happens, it flows from him. Allahu yabda'u al-khalq. Some scholars have said that al-khalq, God originates creation. They say, why should we limit it to human beings? Why should we limit it to man? It's speaking about all of creation. Allahu yabda'u al-khalq. And if you ask these mufassireen, okay, what is the meaning of thumma yu'idu, that he will bring it back? They say, yes, it's not only man that will return. Everything will come back. Allah, for example, in Surah, uh, Surah 75, verses 3 and 4, uh, he speaks about, so, you know, if we speak about the human being, you know, you know, before we speak about the rest of creation, when, so, Allah, and then he will bring it back. There are those who say this is a reference to man, human beings. And Allah will not only bring us back, but He will do it with mind-boggling precision. What do we mean by this? You know, if a painting is destroyed, it's very difficult to restore the painting exactly as it was. There might be some slight differences. If you shatter a piece of glass, it becomes pulverized. It's difficult to completely take the same material and recreate it. Look, look what Allah says in Surah 75, ayah number 3 and 4. Allah says, أَيَحْسَبُ الْإِنسَانُ أَلَّنْ نَجْمَعَ عِظَامَ Does man really think, does the human being really think that we shall not gather his bones Allah says not only will we bring you back not only are we capable of gathering your bones we will even restore your fingerprint we will even restore your fingerprint 
Allahu yabda ul khalq thumma yu'idu. God originates creation and he will bring it back just as it was before exactly. And 14 centuries ago people didn't know that every person has a unique fingerprint. Even twins don't have the same fingerprint. Everyone's genetic code will be preserved and it will be recreated. Now if, as I said, some scholars say that Allahu yabda'u al-khalq, God originates creation, refers to all of creation. Human beings, jinn, the sun, the, the universe. Why should we limit it to one segment of creation? And then he will bring it back. Yes, he will bring back not just human beings, not just jinn. The earth will be recreated. Allah in the Quran, he mentions, يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ وَالسَّمَاوَاتِ On the day in which the earth, the earth will be transformed and the heavens will be transformed. So they will be restored, but they, there will be some modifications that will take place to, to prepare for the hereafter. Because the laws that govern Alam al Akhira are not the same as the natural laws that govern Alam al Dunya. So they will be returned, but there will be some adjustments that are made. So, Allahu yabda al khalq, we can look at it in general terms. That God originates creation and then He brings it back. And then, and you, and you see that Allah uses the word thumma. Allahu yabda ul khalq thumma yu'idu. The word thumma means that then he will bring it back, but after the passing of time. It's not something that will happen instantaneously, meaning that there is a time gap. Now you would think that the verse would have stopped there. Allahu yabda ul khalq thumma yu'idu. God originates creation. Right? We understand what that means. And then, of course, what's implied is that everything will perish and He will bring it back. And then after some time, unto Him, then unto Him you shall be returned. Now, when He brings it back, isn't that the day of judgment? Why does Allah have to add the clause ثُمَّ إِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ When we are resurrected, doesn't the day of judgment, isn't that, isn't that the return to God? So there's, there's a subtlety here. Allahu يَبْدَأُ الْخَلْقِ God originates creation. Then He brings it back. Meaning what? He brings it back. Resurrection. Why why do we see that there is this addition of thumma ilayhi turja'un and then after some time you will return to God. You shall return to him. It seems that when our lives are restored, when we are resurrected from our graves, it seems that there is a waiting period before the Day of Judgment officially begins. This is perhaps the reason why the word Thumma is used. They are brought back, and then Thumma, after some time passes, they will return to God, meaning they will return to Him for judgment. The Day, the day of Judgment will officially begin. But it won't, the Qiyamah won't happen. Hisab won't happen immediately when people come out of their graves. There's going to be some time that's going to pass. If you look at Surah Al-Hajj, verse number 2, we might gain some insight into the meaning of the meaning behind this time gap between coming out of the graves and the official beginning of reckoning. Allah says in ayah number 2 of Surah Al-Hajj, وَتَرَ النَّاسَ سُكَارًا وَمَا هُمْ بِسُكَارًا 
When people come out of their graves, they will be disoriented. They will be intoxicated with fear. And it seems that that dis, that they will be left in a state of disorientation for some time until the angels who are the administrators of Yom al qiyamah until they take them to their designated uh, positions on the Day of Judgment. So people come out of their graves, they're in a type of stupor, they're disoriented. And when that disorientation wears off a bit, then they're directed by the Malaika to go to their positions, their stations, and then the, the Day of Judgment will begin. So this thumma ilayhi turja'un seems to indicate that when people come out of their graves, some time will pass for people to kind of come to terms with what has happened, to understand the magnitude of what has happened, that they have been resurrected. And this, you know, people are scattered, they're confused. Some people come out of their graves and they don't know what's going on. They're completely disoriented. And then they shall return to God. Meaning then their journey begins. So just as they have to go, th just as they went through phases in their physical creation, in dunya, in the wombs of their mothers, Yom Al-Qiyamah is, is like a, is a type of, is a type of womb. It has its own stages, its own stations that we have to pass through. And then the end will be either Paradise or hellfire. Some have the capacity to be purified, and those will be the ones who end up in paradise. And there are those who do not have the ability to be purified because their souls have been fully corrupted, and and they suffer. And and by the way, hell, Jahannam is is simply the physical manifestation of distance from God. Yom Al-Qiyamah is the physical manifestation of being away from Allah. And this is what they chose. Allah يَبْدَأُ الْخَلْقِ ثُمَّ يُعِيدُ ثُمَّ إِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ And then Allah says, ayah number 12, وَيَوْمَ تَقُومُ السَّاعَةُ يُبْلِسُ الْمُجْرِمُونَ And on the day when the hour is established, the hisab, the the reckoning begins. The guilty shall despair. Now, why is it that these wrongdoers, these evil people, why are they in despair? Don't we always talk about this idea that Allah's mercy is all-encompassing? If Allah is so merciful, shouldn't everyone have hope, why should they despair? Now, yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is, is beyond our comprehension. In Dua Kumail that we read, we find in the first sentence, the first part of Dua Kumail, Allahumma in yas'aluka bi rahmatika lati wasi'at kulla shay. I ask you by, O oh Lord, O oh Allah, I ask you by your mercy. And what type of mercy is this? A mercy which encompasses all things. If Allah's mercy encompasses all things, isn't this mujrim, this evildoer, this, isn't he one of those things that should be encompassed by Allah's mercy? The answer is yes. Allah's mercy is available to all. It's, it's all encompassing. But the individual has chosen not to benefit from this mercy. This person has lost the capacity. You know, it's like someone is extending their hand to pull you out, but you, the mercy is there, but you, you have to make some effort. You have to extend your hand. Allah's mercy is available, but some have deprived themselves of that mercy. It's not that the mercy is not there. They they chose to turn away from that mercy. 
Furthermore, you find that the wrongdoer, the guilty shall despair on that day because what they thought had value doesn't have any value on the day of judgment. And what they thought was frivolous and was meaningless actually has value on this day. Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam in a beautiful hadith he says annasu fi dunya bil amwal people in the earthly life in dunya they transact with wealth it's their currency people in dunya they transact with wealth wa fil akhirati bil a'mal but in the akhira the transactions are all based on your deeds. The currency of that world is al-amal al-salih. It's iman, it's faith, it's good deeds. So these criminals, these guilty people, they despair because they have no currency in that world. They have nothing. The money that they amassed in their lives, it doesn't have any value. It's like someone telling you, you spend so much time gathering all of these pieces of paper and you think it's money, but someone says, no, this is monopoly money. It doesn't have any value. If you go to the bank, can you deposit monopoly money in the bank? They'll tell you, please go home. You probably have coronavirus. You're not thinking straight. It doesn't have value. So these people... The, the world, the political power that they were obsessed with, the money that they were obsessed with, their properties, their, their degrees, their social status, all of these things, it doesn't have any value. Their friends, their, their country clubs, whatever it is, they realize that they're in despair because none of that means anything today. And they are also in despair because they realize now they might have been able to cheat the court system in dunya. They might be able to bribe, have, they may be in their lives, they were able to bribe this judge and that judge and they were able to, you know, manipulate the justice system in dunya. But can you manipulate the Supreme Court of Allah Azza wa Jalla? Can you? So they will lie on the Day of Judgment. They will try to make excuses. They will play the victim card. But none of it will, none of it will be of any avail. There is too much incriminating evidence against them. Their own limbs incriminate them. They have no, they have no way of, of proving their innocence. They're, they feel broken. They're silent. They don't, they've lost all opportunities to present an argument on their own behalf. Completely and utterly in despair. We ask Allah to protect us from that. And then Allah says in ayah number 13, They have no intercessors. From among those they ascribed as partners, and they will disbelieve in those they ascribe as partners. You know, when we think about ascribing partners to Allah, we always think about idols, or, you know, theologically believing that God has a partner. Of course, that has its own problems. But many of us, we, we ascribe Practical partners to Allah. Meaning that we, we have, we put so much hope and so much faith in, in systems, in entities, in things other than Allah. We think that my money is going to be my source of security. That my desires, you know, some people, they're mushrikeen, not because they believe in two gods, theoretically. No, theoretically they're monotheists. But they have another god that they worship. They follow their own desires. Why? Because they think, 
practically they think that my nafs is my God. My desires are my God because I act on those desires because I, I think that this is going to be my pathway to peace and happiness and fulfillment. But all of these partners, all of these entities that we thought would give us refuge, they will be of no avail to us. They have no intercessors from among those who ascribed as partners. And they will, they will then disbelieve. There will be a type of disavowal that will take place. When they realize that these partners, these friends, these systems, these entities, these superpowers cannot protect them today, they will reject them. They'll see how useless they are. In fact, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 166, Allah says, you know, the follower and the followed will condemn each other. These strong alliances and partnerships, partnerships that we see today, they will break down on that day. If tabarra الَّذِينَ اتُّبِعُوا مِنَ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوا وَرَأُوا الْعَذَابُ وَتَقَطَّعَتْ بِهُمُ الْأَسْبَابُ Allah says in in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 166, when those who were followed, so these are the leaders, when those who were followed disavow those who followed and they see the punishment while all recourse will be cut off from them. There is no escape. There is no way out except through Allah. But Allah is a stranger to me. I have no relationship with this creator. I'm a, I fear, I'm afraid of him. I have, there is nothing, there is no trace of him in my heart. I'm, I'm far away from, I'm cut off from Allah. So what is the condition of such a person? That his nafs repels him from God. And he runs away from his creator and then the further he runs, the more he suffers. But everything about him and in his soul pulls him away from God. Because everything about his life was, was completely disconnected from his creator. And it's not only that the follower and the followed among people and this, these partners and these intercessors are going to Sever ties. Shaytan himself, Shaytan himself will disavow all of those who follow him. In Surah Ibrahim, verse 22, and this is an ayah that, you know, whenever you are tempted to commit a sin and, and give in to the satanic temptations, read this ayah, because this is something that the same Iblis who is Inviting you today, he will betray you on the day of judgment. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرُ Shaytan will make a public announcement on the day of judgment. After it's all said and done, after judgment has been rendered, after people have been taken to account, Shaytan will stand and he will make a public statement. What will he say? He'll address this ocean of people and jinn, billions if not trillions of them. Inna Allah, and Allah mentions this in the Quran, this is of, Allah is forecasting this. Inna Allah wa'adakum wa'ad al He begins by saying what? Indeed, what God, what Allah promised is true. وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ And I also promised you. I made promises. But I, I break my promise. I have broken my promise to you. وَمَا كَانَ لِيَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سلطان. People on the Day of Judgment, they're going to point the finger at Shaytan. Ilahi, why are you punishing me? I'm innocent. I'm a victim. Punish Shaytan. It's Shaytan's fault. It's Iblis. It's not me. 
Shaitan will say, no, 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 no. I had no authority over you. وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانِ I did not have any sovereignty or authority over you. The only, the only capability that Allah gave me, the only power that I had was what? إِلَّا أَنْ دَعُوتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُ مِي The only thing that I did was I, I invited you. You accepted the invitation. You know, this verse makes the, the hairs on my neck stand. Believe me. Shaitan said, I didn't have, I didn't force you. I didn't pull you. You're not a robot. I wasn't, you're not a remote control car that I'm controlling. I don't have a remote for your soul. I invited you. You accepted the invitation. Shaitan says, don't play the victim card. Don't blame me. Blame yourself. Blame yourself. I will not be able to answer your cries for help. And you will also not be able to answer my cry for help. This is the reality, brothers and sisters. This is what Allah means when He says that on, th on that day there is there is no true friendship. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, what does He say? That the that the true bond the one relationship that will not break on the Day of Judgment is the relationship between Mu'mineen. Mu'mineen are very loyal to each other. Believers are loyal. They won't disavow each other. They will help each other on that. But it's these fake friendships that are based on following desires, that are based on, on the pursuit of worldly pleasures, that have nothing to do with Allah. A relationship that's built on dunya is not a true relationship. A relationship that, that's built on faith, that's a relationship that will endure. Verse number 14, And on the day when the hour comes, that day they will be separated. One of the names of the Day of Judgment is Yawm al The Day of Division. In, in this life, the believers and the disbelievers, the righteous and the wicked and the... Everyone is mixed. Sometimes in one family, one family, you have believers and non-believers. You have righteous and you have corrupt. Everyone is mixed. That's the nature of this life. But on in that world, people are they're divided. They're separated. Now, one obvious manifestation of this is that people, some are separated into paradise. Others are separated into into the hellfire. Even on the day of judgment. You know, this the separation happens even before entrance into paradise or, you know, being cast into the hellfire. In Surah Al-Hadid, there's an interesting interaction between the mu'mineen and the munafiqeen and the hypocrites. Ayah number 13 of Surah Al-Hadid, Surah 57, verse 13. يَوْمَ يَقُولُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ وَالْمُنَافِقَاتِ On the day when the, the hypocrites, male and female, will say to the believers, يَوْمَ يَقُولُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ وَالْمُنَافِقَاتِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُ So the hypocrites will say to the believers, أُنْظُرُونَ نَقْتَبِسْ مِنْ نُورِكُمْ That you know, wait for us is one meaning because on the day of judgment, the only source of light is the light that emanates from the hearts of the believers. Yes, that their light will be cast in front of them and 
to the right side. But if your soul is completely darkened, you, you cannot find your way. Because there's a journey that you have to go on on the Day of Judgment to reach paradise. There's a, there's a, a journey that has to be traversed. So the munafiqun, because they have no nur, they have no light, they say to the believers, wait so we can catch up and we can use, we can benefit from your light. Or it means, look at us. Because if you gaze at us, your light will shine on us. And we'll be able to, to kind of move forward and find our way. But it will be said to them, turn back and seek a light. Meaning, the the time where you should have acquired nur, the time where you should have added light to the light in your heart, is in dunya. This light is the light of iman. It's the light of righteous deeds. You can't just borrow it on this day. You were supposed to develop this this internal light in dunya. And then Allah says, فَضُرِبَ بَيْنَهُمْ بِسُورٍ لَهُ بَابٌ بَاطِنُهُ فِيهِ الرَّحْمَةِ وَظَاهِرُهُ مِنْ قِبَلِهِ الْعَذَابِ Thereupon, on, on, the, on the day of resurrection, this is before entrance into paradise, or entrance into the hellfire, thereupon a wall with a gate will be set down between them. There will be a wall. The munafiqun will not be able to benefit from the light of the believers. And the believers, of course, their their souls are so pure that they are they are repelled. They're repelled by these darkened souls. Thereupon a wall with a gate will be set down between them. The inner side of the wall of which contains mercy. So the mu'mineen, there's this type of structure, a wall. Of course, we use the word wall, but we don't know the reality of this wall. I mean, there's no way of actually understanding that reality until we experience it. But there's a divider. Within it is mercy, because the mu'mineen are together. There's a type of affinity between their hearts. They have similar spiritual personalities. And on the outer side of which lies punishment. There's nothing but darkness and wulma. So this division happens even on the Day of Judgment. Because you can no longer mix the believers with the non-believers. In the same way that you cannot mix water with oil, the mu'min can no longer remain in the company of the munafiq. Because in that world, the spiritual side of man is is enhanced. And a heart that is filled with light cannot be in the company. It is disturbed. It is bothered by the heart that is darkened. You can't mix the two. فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ فَهُمْ فِي رَوْضَةٍ يُحْبَرُونَ As for those who believe and perform righteous deeds, they will be made joyous in a garden. Of course, people are, they're not separated arbitrarily on the Day of Judgment. The basis of this separation is what? Faith and good deeds. And this is the reason why these people are honored. They're not honored because of kinship or because of any worldly standards, they are honored, they are made joyous because of the degree of their iman and the quality and the quantity of their deeds. They will be made joyous in a garden. You know, rawwa is a place that collects water and is very dense with vegetation. This is called rawda in Arabic. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts these people in a place where 
it is it is the best place for the person and the fitra of man the base nature of man is most attracted to these places and i've mentioned this many times where you know the one of the reasons why paradise is always described in terms of gardens and rivers is because you know the greenery and the 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 crystal clear water the running water the flowing rivers it's because it's in our nature to be attracted to these things it's part of the fitra of the human being you know even if you look at the vacation the best vacation vacation destinations in the world most of them are tropical areas places where there's water and there's you know beautiful scenery there's greenery so they're they're there yuhbarun meaning that they are so elated they're so happy that their joy is manifested in their eyes and their speech and their demeanor they're honored they're honored in every way you can be honored they are they they are they are greeted by angels they have servants they have purified spouses they live in a, the purest environment they're in the company of prophets and good people they hear nothing that disturbs them they are in close proximity to allah wa lahum fiha ma yashaun they have everything that they want everything that they desire wa amma alladhina kafaru ayah number 16 wa amma alladhina kafaru wa kadhabu bi ayatina wa liqa'i al-akhira fa ulaika fi al-adhab muhdharun but as for those who disbelieve and denied our signs so not only did they disbelieve they denied you know there was an active type of opposition to the divine message but as for those who disbelieved and denied our signs and they also they denied the meeting of the hereafter they did not ever think in their wildest dream that they would meet god meeting god means that the the veils that have blinded you from from his powerful presence is lifted in the dunya many people they say god doesn't exist because i can explain the chains of the chain of cause and effect as if you know just because you know how something works it means that there's no manufacturer you know just because you know how an engine works doesn't negate the existence of an engineer so many of these people because they because they think because they can explain the creation of the universe they think that it doesn't need a creator so they're blinded by the, the chain of causality but in alam al akhirah they are clearly able to see that there is a direct connection between every created thing and allah that allah that the, you know the the system of cause and effect still is it's still there but it's something that's it's more faded what is very apparent is the link the direct link between allah and everything that is experienced in the hereafter and the, so these people who reject they reject allah's signs they deny his signs and they deny the meeting with god they will be arraigned onto the punishments muhdharun you know when someone is arraigned in in a, in a court system meaning they're 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 forced to be there no one is standing in front of a judge because they want to especially if they're guilty they're they are made to be present allah says these people they are because everyone you know is is muhdharun on the day of judgment if you look at surah yasin ay 72 wa in kullun jami'u ladaina muhdharun everyone will be arraigned on the day of judgment but some will be arraigned they will be made present you know in the same way someone is dragged to court they're forced to be there they don't appear just by their own free will they're they're made to appear in court Allah says these people no even if they wanted to escape they are made they are arraigned in the punishment because that is the the projection of their 
their own souls. They created hellfire, and now they have to live with the creation of their own souls. With that, we will conclude our discussion. As I mentioned, brothers and sisters, I'm so sorry that uh, I won't able to entertain uh, questions and answers this evening, but inshallah, uh, we'll be able to uh, carry it over in our next session. If there are any questions, please share it in the, uh, the chat room. And uh, inshallah, if Allah gives us life, if he continues to uh, keep us in this life, we will inshallah take on, uh, we'll address the questions in our next session. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahireen.